Primaries are over. This week at Missouri Politics Hot Edition, and there was a lot of winners on primary night. Perhaps none more than my guest now, Senator Bill Eigel. Congratulations on what had to be a stupendous night for you. Uh, well, I, I was certainly happy with a lot of the results, Scott. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I, I think that the primary that we just came through may be one of the most impactful primaries we see in the Republican yeah. Party for, a lot, for uh, the next few years. We had candidates that consistently were performing better uh, with Missouri Republican voters that were talking about precisely the kind of issues that uh, myself and a few of my colleagues have been talking about for the past few years. So well, we're let me very just excited. Yes, if you had to vote in some of these races, you might have voted for Curtis Trent. You might have voted for Elizabeth Coleman. I, I know you would have voted uh, for Nick Shore and Ben Brown. I seen you out helping them. That uh, those wins had to feel very, very good. You bet. Uh, I'm looking forward to serving with each of those members. We supported their campaign. We supported their efforts, and I think they're going to be great additions to the Missouri State Senate. So big news. You've had a conservative caucus for four years now. Mm -hmm. You and Senator Hoskins were probably two of the senior members that were returning uh, in January. You, you put out an announcement that you disbanded the caucus. Why was that? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the conservative caucus uh, was never meant to be a permanent institution. It was mm -hmm. never meant to be something that existed in perpetuity and that never went away. There was always going to be a point that we wanted to reunite with our colleagues under a single exclusive banner of the Republican Party. Part of the reason for the split in the first place is we felt uh, that, that uh, others in the caucus were moving in a direction that, that we didn't want to go and we had different areas of emphasis. But this was always part of the plan as it were and we're glad that especially with the results of a primary election that we felt were overwhelmingly of an endorsement of the issues that we've been talking about for the past four years this was the right time to do it and offer that olive branch uh, to other colleagues that for whatever reason we haven't been able to see maybe eye to eye up until this point we have a new day well it, it honestly felt in that room probably nobody uh, is dorky enough to watch as many hours as you all's action as I am we sit in that room, it feels like you had a really cohesive group of conservative caucus members, and you had a reasonably you know, larger, little tougher group of, of Republican caucus members, but when you two were together, it was a shotgun marriage. It was just uncomfortable, awkward, a little stressful, and it really felt like it boiled over with the congressional map debate. Right. Coming back, you offer an olive branch. What does that look like? Uh, it looks like us asking our colleagues to be a part of what we think would be a new leadership coalition. Uh, we've had a lot of strife over the past four years, and we've gotten to see how uh, both of our leaders have uh, acted and responded to those. And now I think we're at the point where uh, we'd like to see a new coalition, one built on a foundation of trust between all the members, uh, one that builds upon empowering each of those 24 Republicans to pass the legislation uh, that we want to see passed and to work on the issues that are important to us in our districts. In many cases, we haven't had that. And now, uh, I'll tell you what, you mentioned the redistricting maps. You know, that was one of the uh, questions that I felt like there was a lot of agreement between myself and a lot of Republican primary voters, but maybe not as many of my colleagues as I would have thought. So uh, that's, uh, you know, when you have the Republican electorate way into the level that it did, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear what, what they want to see more of in, in the Missouri Senate. It's not necessarily more fighting, but it is the promotion of the priorities that the Republican Party across the state has been talking about in campaign seasons for a generation. So uh, break this down. You, you extend an olive branch. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first thing that popped in people's mind is, well, one, Oh, this isn't real. Is this a real effort? If um, it, when you sit down for leadership elections after after the November elections, mm -hmm. and you get in that room, mm -hmm. if you guys come together, and you let's say have a Caleb Brown and Mike Burns scatter win, can that work? Well, I, I tell you what. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, you know. I would say that when it comes to those leadership races, it is a real thing. I mean, if, if the war between the Republicans continues, uh, it's probably, as we saw in these primaries, it's probably not going to be those that were aligned with the conservative caucus that will be uh, suffering at the ballot box uh, in the upcoming elections. So I think that that's something, you know, when we talk about who should the leaders be, I'm thinking about who's going to be protecting the caucus, who's going to be protecting us from, quite frankly, votes that uh, were horrible votes for members to be taking, horrible votes for them to be voting against the issues that we were taking votes against uh, and seeing Republicans vote against on the Senate floor. And so if the war continues, uh, that I don't think that that's going to be good for uh, the broader 
folks in the in the caucus. So we're extending this olive branch. I think they're going to embrace it. I think the message that peace is the way forward, that our priorities are the way forward, is going to be something a lot of folks are going to be interested in. Whether it could be Caleb Browden, whether it could be Mike Burns. I'll tell you this, Scott. I'm well, willing. Like a running for pro well, well, I am willing to support any Republican senator for those leadership positions that is ready to empower each of the Republican members of the caucus and can build enough trust to build that that majority coalition. So, from my perspective, uh, the thing about Caleb Browden is we've, we've, we've kind of seen how uh, the past four years have gone. Now, can it, can I can can there exist peace within the chamber if Caleb Brown becomes the pro tem? It's possible. Although we've had kind of a trial run for the past four years, and I think that's why we're talking about a different leadership coalition. Will it be Bill Eigel? I got to be honest with you, Scott. I don't know if it should be Caleb Brown nor Bill Eigel to be in the leadership team. You know, if we're truly going to start a new day, if we're truly going to leave the labels behind and start new coalitions, I don't know that it ought to be me. But I'm ready to get behind somebody that I think is prepared to bring this caucus together so that we don't have the same kind of fights two years from now that we saw over the summer. Talk about bringing this caucus together. Mm -hmm. You talk about maybe leadership team including a member of the conservative caucus. Mm -hmm. I think of Andrew Koenig. That's somebody you're Absolutely. thinking of? Absolutely. Uh, Andrew Koenig is someone who's already going around talking about possibly being mm -hmm. a floor leader. I don't know if it, you think about the, the things that you want to see in the leader of the chamber. You want somebody that's passed big legislation. You want somebody that's compromised on big issues and got big legislation done. You want somebody that's uh, been through a difficult election fights. Uh, you want somebody that is respected by the different factions that may exist within the caucus. Uh, Andrew Koenig checks all those boxes, so I think he'd be a great leader and a great choice uh, for one of those leadership positions. So, I, there are a lot of choices out there. Um, you know, you got to look at you know what what are the history of some of these senators? What have they done? You know, if it if it's a Mike Burns getter, we're going to be looking at uh, what bills has he been in charge of for the past year, and how did that go? Uh, if it's Caleb Browden for pro tem, we're going to be looking at well, how did the overall management go uh, when when uh, Caleb was in charge of the chamber? These are these are important questions. I will say that I think that every one of our our colleagues is looking and listening very closely to every word that Caleb or myself or anybody else uh, that's a part of these discussion uh, is talking every about. Tweet, uh, the whole, every tweet, the whole, the whole every tweet, yards, everything yeah. else. And you know, I, I, I can't. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I have spoken directly in person to uh, a majority of the Republican caucus and the message that I have gotten from them so far is that they're prepared for a new leadership coalition. Now, Let me what ask, names you, and you what seats? You said something very important, I thought, when you said empowering every senator. Mm -hmm. Does that mean, I mean, obviously the way you break the Senate, the way you disempower a senator is vote for a PQ. Mm -hmm. Mike Bernsketter has sure. never voted for a PQ. Mm -hmm. When you look at a leadership candidate, I mean, if you get all 24 of you on the same path, mm -hmm. are you talking PQs? Because, I mean, that would obviously be taking all the power away from a senator, making them a house member with a bigger office. If, uh, if, the, if the Senate gets to a place where all, four, all 24 Republican senators are rowing in the same direction, uh, I'm pretty comfortable with that outcome. Now, whether it leads to PQs or not, PQs are not just a function of a majority that mm -hmm. wants to get something done. They're, they're a function of a minority that's willing to compromise and negotiate. So uh, to ask about a PQ, well, uh, you know, the, the majority can be willing to compromise and negotiate, but if the minority is not, uh, that it's not going to work out and we're going to see a PQ. So that takes the president presence of a PQ or non-presence of a PQ is something that takes 34 senators, not 24, not 10. But I can tell you that I would like to see many more of these conversations taking place, uh, the struggles between Republicans and Democrats, not between different points in the Republican Party. I mean, honestly, the things you're saying right now, the real loser there is Senator Rizzo, right? He's had a pretty decent run of it with you guys <laughs> fighting with each other. I'm sure if he could pick, he'd just yes. say, keep going, fellas. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. You know, I, and unfortunately, I, I think that uh, that actually, in a broader sense, you know, has been bad for the Republican caucus and the Republican brand. If you look at some of the things that we were hearing Democrats say on the Senate floor just this past year, how they think that they've gotten the most progressive budget passed that they've ever seen, how they think that they've had one of their most successful years. John J.J. Rizzo uh, mentioned in public that he feels that Senate Democrats are more relevant today than they have been in 20 years. That was a quote from J.J. Rizzo. Uh, and I think, in a way, that's an indictment of our current leadership team. Uh, that's an indictment of the failures to bring them Do you feel a little bit uh, responsible for that, too? What we've always, every senator in there is partially responsible, right? Every senator that's part of the 24 is responsible. But I'll tell you what, what we have always tried to do, what I've always tried to do is talk about the things that the Republican electorate sent us to Jefferson City to do. And I think, unfortunately, we got far enough away that uh, we've had a pretty significant primary fight 
I want to see us move away from that. I want to see, I don't want to see any more summers like we just had where uh, incumbents are looking over their shoulder because bad votes were taken in the regular session and we're fractured as a caucus. We can move away from that. I don't know that we can do it uh, with the same leadership team, but uh, I, this you, is an opportunity to find you out. You mentioned that. If you were in um, Senator Schott and Senator Routen's shoes, give me a couple things you would have done differently. Maybe a different approach you would have taken. Well, I, I tell you what, the, the first thing uh, that we did, uh, I, I wouldn't let bills uh, that senators work for very, uh, very diligently die in fiscal oversight after they make it off the Senate floor. Uh, I think that there's a couple uh, structural things that we need to do to make sure that there aren't trap doors built in that aggravate senators from both sides of the chamber. So there are some structural things I think we could look at, but empowering senators means you're genuinely working towards making commitments and making good on commitments to senators that have priority legislation. Let me ask you the, 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 the last question of that. You had big gains, mm -hmm. probably if you start doing the math, maybe not quite enough. If it comes out that Senator Rowden, who's running for pro tem, is elected, it's going to be closer than it would have been before sure. the August election. Let's say Senator Bernscatter is the floor leader. Mm -hmm. Can you show up with the same attitude or ready to work together? Absolutely. The priorities have not changed uh, regardless of who's in the leadership team. Uh, the questions that we'll have to answer at that point is, can we make a new commitment to the same priorities with the same team uh, that wasn't able to get a lot of these things done in previous years? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. So, you gonna get a the, trial run in special session? Maybe. Governor's maybe. special session? I'll tell you what, it's never a bad time to cut taxes, and so if we're cutting taxes, that's a good chance to do it. I saw your social media when the governor first talked about this. Mm -hmm. uh, you were very supportive. I think the Masvidal bill, there's a lot of folks that want to see that done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does make it a little odd that you would give urban St. Louis six years and then rural St. Clair County two years. Right. But but it seems to me that's that fight's kind of moving past that now. Mm -hmm. You're into the tax cut. But the governor's throwing out $700 million. I've seen the House throw out numbers of like $2 billion or whatever. And I think they're down maybe a billion for whatever the number of the day is. Right. It's a lot. Where are you going to be? Uh, I tell you, I, I'm willing to cut taxes as much as the body uh, thinks is good for the state. I, I'll tell you what, let's talk a little, a little bit about the budget. You know, the budget last year produced a surplus beyond the previous year of more than $2 billion. This There's year, a reason for that, right? Uh, Sure, because government is always getting bigger and it's always taking in more revenue. But so not in state even, government, right? Even, even uh, yeah, in the state government, even that's general. Those are general revenues that were up more than two billion dollars alone in the past year. In the first fiscal month of this year, it's up forty percent over those numbers. So when I talked to the governor, he and I both agreed that we've got so much money to coming into the state that of all the problems we face, not a single one of them has to do with a lack of commitment by the taxpayer in Missouri. So we are in a position, $700 million is great. We could cut a, we could cut a lot bigger and not impact any of the services uh, that we currently provide at the state level in Jefferson City. So the thing I enjoy talking about with you is business. Mm. If you're in your business, if you were planning to do some cuts, mm -hmm. planning to do change some things around, I mean, conservative means a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It also means moving slowly. Is it better to cut taxes a chunk right now and review it in a year and cut it? I don't think you're going to lose your tax cutting majority anytime soon, right? So is it smarter to cut them a little bit at a time or you just lop the whole thing off and then risk having to need money? Well, it, it could be, but I'll tell you what, our revenues aren't taking it one bite at a time. The, the revenues are, are exploding exponentially, it seems like, uh, every single year. Even for the federal dollars that are coming in, uh, that we're told are full, are one-time dollars that are coming in every new year that comes back, somehow there's new federal dollar, new one-time federal dollars filling in those those spaces. So like uh, we have fish on Current River. Am I going <laughs> to fish a number out of you? There is. I, I don't. I, we haven't decided about the number yet. I, I tell you what. I look at the seven hundred million dollars that the governor has has put out there as a starting point of the discussion. We have a lot of room to cut much, much further than that and not impact services. And if we're going to come in in special session and do it, we ought to take that opportunity. Uh, the closer we can get to other states that are growing, like Texas, like Florida, that don't even have an income tax, I think the better we're going to be. But I mean, you're a businessman, though. Mm -hmm. You know there's a reason they have an income tax. They have oil revenues, tourism. Sure. It's not like there's re they take in revenue. They just have some things. I mean, I, I think people should absolutely go look at the streets of St. Charles in your district. But people, more people go to the beach. There's, there's no question. Uh, we all understand that when nobody's talking about a lack of government uh, and anarchy, but at the same time, we spend more per capita in the state of Missouri per citizen than Illinois, California, and New York. That's how much we're spending out of Jefferson City. So it's a big number, and we've got to bring that number down. Our reliance on the federal government, we get more than 50% of our budget from the federal government now. So for anybody out there that's a fan of the 10th Amendment, that's, uh, uh, that, that has almost gone out the window when we're taking that much uh, substance from the federal government in Washington, D.C. You take that much money, you got a boss, right? That's right. 
Senator Agle, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to watching special session unfold. Always a pleasure, Scott. Be right back with our Opinion Maker panel. Representative Roger Reedy's first time on the show after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople, while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work, Ameren, Missouri. I'm a history buff, like I know a lot of you are if you watch the show. We're doing a thing of the history of Missouri. We're gonna do it one county at a time. We call it Show Me Missouri. We're gonna to travel to all 114 counties of the state. We'll have a member of the Farm Bureau, a county elected official, some of your state legislators you see here on the show. We're gonna talk about the history, what's happening now in the county and how the two are interconnected. It's a passion project of mine. If you like history, I hope you'll get involved. Follow us, uh, go to the MissouriTimes.com. You can see it. We'll probably branch it off into its own social media at some point. But you've been so good to us at the Missouri Times, the show, different papers. This is a passion project that I hope you'll enjoy. It's called Show Me Missouri, the history of Missouri, one county at a time. The first county was Polk County. We had a great time. And we hope you'll uh, go to MissouriTimes.com, find out a little bit about it. And if you like the history of the state, I hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome back to Weekend Missouri Politics from our studios, the University of Central Missouri here at CAMOS. We'll introduce Adam Summer, attorney, local Warrensburg guy, host of the Heartland Podcast. Yeah. Adam, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, right down the street from my office. Representative Emily Weber, tons of fun things in Kansas City or in your district, aren't they? Love it, yes, it's a great district. Thanks for having us. Jake Scott, Chief of Staff Senator Bill Eigel, longtime Republican activist. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. And the first time. Roger Reedy, Benton County. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Glad to be here today, and welcome to Central Missouri. Love it. <laughs> Represent, let me start off with this U.S. Senate race. Um, Eric Schmidt wins the primary by a decisive, huge amount. Him, him being a German-American, I'm sure your constituents like that. Then uh, Senator Danforth came up with a... <laughs> It, it, you know, it's, it's almost comical at this point, but he came up with a, an independent candidate, and instead of picking a Dave Schatz or picking someone like yourself, like a field dress a deer, he picked some Ivy League lawyer that don't even live here. Well, well, that farce kind of came to an end. I mean, now, if you're a Republican, you got to feel even better about it, November, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Eric Smith is a great candidate. Uh, he's going he's gonna to do well in November. Uh, you know, we're kind of here in the... Uh, central part of Hartsler country, but uh, you know, those Hartsler voters are going to, I believe most of them are going to move over and vote for Smith in the fall and uh, he's going to have a good November. I tell you, I'm glad you brought her up. I was at the State Fair. I was uh, standing in the Farm Bureau building and I watched Congresswoman Hartsler walk into the room, walk right up to Billy Long, shake his hand. Now he said some things on Twitter that, yeah, a little salty. I don't know that I would have the class and grace that she did. I, I admired her so much for that. Well, you know, the Congresswoman has served us since 2010 here, mm -hmm. and uh, she's done a great job. She's well respected, and that's just truly who she is. Yes, I believe that. Adam Summer, I mean, your thought might have been, right, if you're a Democrat, you're like, okay, so we get the, the weirdo pervert, wins the Republican <laughs> primary, then we get Dan Ford to not fail again, which yeah. that, you know, probably Greitens had a better chance than them not failing. But now the, the pervert lost. You have probably the strongest general election candidate you could have in Schmidt. Now the Danforth thing, which if you've ever watched the Danforth stuff for the last 30 years, it, it blew up. Not a great day, not a great scenario that the Democrats are hoping for in November. Yeah, I was, for me, it's shocking that he could make a bigger mistake than Josh Hawley, but he pulled it off uh, <laughs> with, with this John Wood thing. And so I think you got to applaud him for that. Uh, definitely, uh, you and I have talked about this race a lot. And I've, we've talked about it on Heartland Pot a lot that, you know, I thought Vicki had a very good shot at winning that race just because she was being reasonable and she wasn't, you know, blow torches and guns and all that stuff. But when it comes down to it, I don't think that Eric Schmidt, I don't think John Wood was a threat to Eric Schmidt I anyway. I just, I, I never thought it was, but uh, I, I, certainly you got to feel better about it right now if you're in the Schmidt campaign, no doubt. 
I mean, Jake, look, I'm sure Senator Danforth was served the state very well. I think when he left the Senate, I was in elementary school. But since then, my professional life, he just whines and complains all the time. And the one time he won was with the holiday, now he doesn't like that. It almost becomes a joke anymore. Absolutely. And I think, you know, honestly, this John Wood, he may have been a nice guy, but we just, as Republicans, we can't afford to splinter the boat. And this is a good move for him to get out. And, and it's a good maybe move credit for, to him. Because, yeah. I mean, he, it was going to get embarrassing, I think. And, and credit to that guy for saying, you know what, uh, I, and I, you know, if he would have been the person who would uh, run against Eric Rydens, there's one that's a different thing. Someone like myself, I might have taken a serious look at that. But credit to him for saying this probably wasn't going to work. Yeah, I think I think this Republican Party is ready to unite around Eric Schmidt, and we're we're ready to take take the fight to November. I mean, they almost in the primary, well, like 45 percent. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah. Representative um, Trudy Bush Valentine, mm -hmm. very nice person. I saw her, she was at the state fair making the rounds. Uh, I mean, there was a, a very there was a very real scenario where she was going to have a real shot at this. Almost all of that scenario hasn't really materialized. Okay. Well, I, I think that she still has a really good shot at winning. Uh, from what we've been hearing with the Democrats and Republicans, um, a lot of the Republican Party, you know, we, we're, we're door knocking and we're in, we're in red areas. Uh, when we go door, door knock and what they're telling us is they're done with the GOP extremists and what they're looking for is somebody different and they are looking towards Trudy. Do you think she might be better off if she played Here Comes the King and threw out some beer? <laughs> right? I mean, that would be the... I mean, that, maybe that's just I'm saying what I would like. I don't know. <laughs> maybe you need to talk to Representative Wes Rogers about that one. He is, <laughs> he is wanting to do that with her uh, so so bad. Wes Rogers should run every Democrat <laughs> statewide campaign. Uh, you would do better, I assure you. Oh, God. All right. Uh, Adam, the, the baseline's going to be here. Are national Republicans going to have to spend money to prop up Schmidt, or is this just going to be... One of those where Democrats had a shot and the and the, the the it just didn't materialize. Yeah, I don't think that the national Republicans are going to have to do anything in Missouri at this point. Um, it'd be great if they had to, but the reality and you know I'm not knocking the doors like Representative Weber, but uh, I, I do hear from folks who are saying you know we want an adult and and I do think that uh, I think that Attorney General Schmidt's his tack to the right was so extreme that I can see some folks being fed up with that. I'm gonna bet you beer three years in, you're gonna be like, okay, he 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 takes care well, of business. I, I for the texted state. you the other day yeah. when he he posted on Twitter about his story of working at Grants Farm College. I said, man, if that's the guy that ran the entire time, not only do I think he would have won the primary anyway, but then it's a completely different race. Uh, I would say we're, we're talking about the West Rogers vote, which we should make a thing. <laughs> I'm not from Billions. I'm from Bridgen. Is a line that West Rogers. Democrat, I think, would like to hear. <laughs> yeah, of course. Do you think the uh, Do you think the Republicans have to spend money to prop up Schmidt, or is that just gonna Is that plane just gonna land? I don't think so at all. I think Schmidt's a very strong candidate, and he's gonna he's gonna get us a victory. What do you think? Yeah, I think he's ran statewide. He has the name recognition. He was out there uh, working for the people. Uh, you know, uh, when we saw some things happening, uh, people were being limited. Kids were. Yes. Uh, being masked, uh, what, regardless of where you are on that issue, uh, he held up for the people, and uh, I think that really sold well out in this area. I really think that that is the biggest issue of the campaign, the way he grabbed a hold of it, the way things changed when he was involved. I really think that connected on a, on a very deep level and, and put him on the course to win that. But let's talk about special session. Governor came out. He's calling y'all back to work. Uh, the day after Labor Day, um, he wants uh, the Masbita tax credits fixed, and he wants around $700 million in tax. Let's start off the top. Why does it make sense for someone in Chesterfield to get EcoDevo projects or EcoDevo tax credits for six years, but folks in St. Clair County to get them for two? That's right. Uh, you know, we need to be treating our rural, our agricultural interest, we need to be treating them fairly. And a lot of them were on these shorter sunsets, whereas these other projects were given six-year sunsets. And, uh, you know, there's some of them that have actually elapsed. And, uh, uh, you know, people need to be able to do business. They need to be able to plan. And so our uh, agriculture community needs to be treated as well as anyone else. You know, with $94 billion that they bring in every year, uh, to the state of Missouri. They're a big industry. So whoever is the time, fine, to treat a farmer in Warsaw like you do a big city person in Winsville? I mean, with the, with the ag tax, yes. Uh, we, we, we should have been looking at longer tax um, 
longer years on those, sunset years on those, but at the same time, just like what Representative Reedy was saying, they've, a lot of these have already lapsed, and so why take, why, why go to sep, uh, into a special session right now where a lot of these have already, already lapsed, why don't you just sign the bill so we can move on? I think, I think the ink's dry on that veto on that. Let's talk about this tax cut. So I've heard numbers come out of the Senate, five, six hundred million, the governor's at seven hundred million. I think the House is at end all taxes forever. Uh, what, what, what is the, are they going to be able to come to agreement with the House and the Senate on that? Well, I think so. I think this is a perfect opportunity for Republicans to coalesce around an issue that we all care about. This summer has been very difficult for many working families with the rise in inflation and just the out of control spending in Washington. And this is a chance for us uh, as a state to deliver some, uh, some economic relief to folks that need it most. And, you know, there's, there's a difference between having a princi principled compromise and compromising your principles. And we can have a good principled compromise on tax policy. We can get a good cut and, and really uh, deliver some relief. To Spoken families. like the man that works in the office of the senator from tax cuts. Are they going to be able to come to an agreement? Or are you guys just going to get to sit in the Capitol and watch them fight? Here's the thing. I don't believe in this tax cut because it's fiscally irresponsible right now. In our budget, that the surplus that we're getting, it's not going to be there forever. And then on top of that, this tax cut is going to it's the poor and the middle class are not going to get what they what they need. Give it's going to be upper. Quick prediction, Adam. Do they get a tax cut passed? I don't think they do. No. What do you think, Representative? Do they, do they get a tax cut passed? Or do you sit and watch and fight? What do you think? Do they get tax cut passed? I think we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get it done. What do you think? You get it passed? Yeah, I think we will. With a minute left, who won the week? Uh, I would say the young people and the children in the state of Missouri. Nice. They just came off of a great state fair in Sedalia, Missouri, where those 4-H and FFA kids got to show their exhibits that they had worked all year on. And this week, they're back in school, back in session. The teachers are working hard. They won the Me week. and my son, Gussie, had a corn dog on the bench mm -hmm. provided by the Cole County FFA. Who won the week? I'd say Bill Eigel. I think this guy has he's wanted to cut yep. taxes ever since he's come into the Senate. He's gotten it done before, and this is just another opportunity that the governor's provided for us to deliver tax relief. He grabbed it right off. I liked it. Who won the week? Our teachers. This is the first week back to school, yes. and here in Missouri, we do not give our teachers enough credit for what they, what they have to do. Who won the week? Well, if you're a middle class family, 89 cents a day probably doesn't quite do it for you on this tax cut. So I got to go with Eric Schmidt with John Wood dropping out. It pretty much cinches the deal for him. How do folks find the Heartland Podcast? Heartlandpod.com or at the Heartland Pod on Twitter. Great. I'm going to have to say the folks at the State Fair, Mark Wolf, Chris Chin, maybe the best State Fair they've ever had. It just keeps getting better. They keep adding things. Terrific. Kudos to them. And we will see you next week on This Week of Missouri Politics. And we'll see them next year at the State Fair. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and Sterling Bank. Guys, thank you so much for watching the show. I want to tell you about a new thing we're offering. It's the Missouri Times Podcast Network. You'll get this show every week. If you want to listen to it in your car, you don't have time to watch it. You'll get our show in Missouri podcast, History of Missouri, one county at a time. You'll also get our midweek update. Once a week, I throw up the uh, Facebook Live. I, 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 we talk politics. Usually, eat a lunch and discuss politics. You'll get to hear all those things come right to your phone. Subscribe to us on iTunes or Android. Missouri Times Podcast Network. Please join us and subscribe.